Hey friends, greetings and Maranatha. Thank you guys for joining us for the Maranatha Fast and the Maranatha Global Bible Study of the End of the Age that ran parallel to the fast over the last 14 days as we've studied the end of the age. Good news, all of the resources that were available during the fast are going to be left on the app, are gonna be available to stream and to download in perpetuity. You can access them, we're not gonna be taking them down. In fact, we're gonna be adding to it and multiplying it exponentially. More on that later. For now, I wanna throw in an additional bonus section because many of you have written in and asked about this. We've been absolutely overwhelmed with questions from people who have been calling and emailing and sending messages on different social media platforms. And this was one of the main questions that got sent in. I wanna take some time to answer the question and address it in what I hope will be a succinct, clear, direct way over an issue that's very important. And it's, it is it is very important, not because of this particular debate over this question, but because of the new realities that open up because of this reality. It's kind of like a, a fence that you go through into a wide open pasture that if you don't go through that fence, you don't even know that pasture exists. You don't even know those rolling hills and those streams and those cattle. You don't know all of the glory that is in those fields. Now, I don't make a big fuss about the preacher rapture because it is dying off on its own. It, it, it was very popular in the 80s popular in the 90s, the Left Behind series, these fictional books that were written on the basis of this teaching, this doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, that is that Jesus comes and takes the church up away, their clothes fall on the floor, and everyone goes, where did they go? And the church sits up in heaven and awaits the second, which would actually be the third coming of Jesus at that point. Now, I think because of the fact that this teaching isn't in the Bible, that it wasn't taught in church history until the mid-1800s, and because most of the church doesn't believe this because they're already living in persecution and tribulation, it has been dying off. That said, there is still a lot of people in the United States in particular, which is really the epicenter of the, the doctrine in terms of believing it, still believe it. And those are many of the questions that people sent in was over this question, not necessarily because they believe it, but because they know people in their family or their church or friends who do believe it and they want some help navigating this question with them for those who do believe it. And that's the question of whether or not the book of Revelation tells about a church in tribulation. The argument goes something like this from the pre-tribulation side. They say that the church is raptured before the great tribulation, taken up, taken out, escapes, secret rapture, taken away, so that Israel and the nations will suffer the tribulation alone while the church is safe, escaping the wrath of God because we are not appointed unto wrath. Which, by the way, not being appointed unto wrath has zero to do with the great tribulation. Not being appointed to wrath has everything to do with the blood of Jesus and the gospel. If you're covered in the blood of Jesus, you're not appointed to wrath. It's like the Passover blood, which is we're in the season of celebrating Passover. This is the whole point of Passover. If you're covered in the blood, the wrath of God will pass over you and your household. Not being appointed unto wrath is not a proof text for the pre-tribulation rapture. It's a proof text for the power of the blood of Jesus. Big difference. But the argument goes along the lines of something like this, that the great tribulation is the wrath of God and therefore the church will be taken out. And we see that it, this is confirmed by many passages. They'll refer to the days of Noah and Enoch being taken up before the flood. They'll use different types and shadows because there aren't explicit Bible verses saying this, so you have to use types and shadows to build the narrative. But one of the key arguments and you can see it by scrolling through our YouTube comment section in the, on our YouTube page, one of the leading rebuttals or, or, or uh, assertions from the pre-tribulation crowd is that the church, you can't find the church in the book of Revelation after chapter 4 when John hears a loud trumpet and is caught up into the throne room. And the argument goes that John is a picture of the church 
and that John, in the same way that John was taken up before the tribulation, he's a picture of the church being taken up before the tribulation. Tribulation begins and John witnesses it from heaven, just like the church will witness it from heaven, and the church isn't in the book of Revelation. That said, what I want to do now is just actually just make mention of this. We're going to be expounding on this in vivid and great detail in the days to come, so make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and get the app because we're going to be going into vivid detail on this on each of these chapters going through these and emphasizing this point because not because we have an axe to grind against a pre-trib thing. Here's why. And I'll, I want you to catch this. And in many ways, if all you catch is this, then shut the video off. This is That's fine. The reason why this is important is because if you don't believe that the church will be present on the earth in the generation of the Lord's return, this is the pasture that you're not even aware exists because it will be the church's finest, most glorious, and greatest hour. It will be the hour when the bride has made herself ready. It's the hour of the church's preparation and great glory. These are the great days that history is moving towards. These are the days that's been burning on Jesus's heart. And when we exempt ourselves from this with a false teaching and a false hope, I should say a false hope that's rooted in a false teaching concerning a convenient escape and exemption from those days. We don't have any mental, theological, emotional, psychological scaffolding to hang anything on once the trouble begins. The Great Tribulation is not something that we should have despair and fear about. It's, it's something that we should have sobriety, trembling, hope, and understanding about that we could enter into those days and be to the glory of God and to the good of those around us. So with that said, we're going to go through, I'm just going to mention it and, and, and throw it at you real quick. And like I said, we'll come back and we'll develop it in more details later. Yes, chapter four, John gets taken up. He's in the throne room. But then what happens? John sees the church throughout the book of Revelation. There are so many passages in the book of Revelation that speak of the church. It's, it's incredible to me that this argument has any validity given the overwhelming emphasis of the church in the tribulation. I would argue, and I say that to say this, I would argue that the main message of the book of Revelation is the patient endurance and the triumph of the church in the great tribulation. The main message is the testimony and the glory of Jesus. The secondary message is the church. The primary message is the wonder and the glory of Jesus. The second message is the bride made ready in the tribulation, in the trouble, in the refining. There's a passage in Revelation 14 that's very powerful in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I thought the church wasn't there. And now you're saying, here's the patience. John's saying, the, the angels are saying, John, look, behold their patience. Behold their endurance. Behold the believers on the earth in that time. Behold, and John, understand this. They're blessed if they die from this point on. Look, you've always been blessed if you die in the Lord, but now if you die during the tribulation, there is a unique blessing that's going to rest upon you because of the uniqueness of the dynamics of that generation that if you don't believe you're going to be here for, make absolutely no sense. Now, conveniently, the preacher rapture guys will say that the saints refer to tribulation saints, not to the body of Christ. There is no reason to say that. It's a circular argument. The pre trib argument is a circular one. You say, well, the church isn't in the book of Revelation. And then you point to the church in Revelation and they'll, they'll say, well, that doesn't refer to the church. That refers to the tribulation church. Go, well, what, how can, what do you, okay. So they're not there, but they are there, but it's not us. It's someone else. It's a different church that we're not a part of. That doesn't make any sense. So let's go through this and just look at them. Chapter five, very, very powerful. We see, uh, it's a very profound statement. It says that the bowls of incense, he sees bowls full of incense filling up. And when the bowls of incense are full, Jesus takes the scroll from the hand of the Father and tears the seven seals, which looses the beginning of the great tribulation. Now we're going to look at this more when we get to chapter eight, but I'll say this. It's the prayers of the saints 
on the earth that loose the very tribulation. The prayers of the saints, this is the first thing that we see of the church on the earth leading up to the tribulation, is bowls full of incense growing. Now, the interesting thing is, by the time we get to chapter 8, the incense is still rising, the prayers are still rising, and the prayers then become the catalytic executioner, execution mechanism of the very judgments of God. We'll look at that when we get to chapter 8. But let's say this, chapter 5, we see the church in prayer and intercession loosing the first judgments. That's powerful. Chapter 6 is the seals, the beginning of the seals being torn. Now, those seals that get torn are being torn in response to the prayers of the saints. Now, there's a very interesting seal. Now, you can look at this in chapter 6, verse 11, and the verses around it. John sees an innumerable multitude under the altar who've been killed. And they're crying out and they're saying, Lord, how long until you avenge our blood? And the response back is not until, not until the full number have been slain as you've been slain. Which means this, at the, during, at the beginning of the judgment series, the, the book of Revelation is structured on seals, trumpets, bowls. Seven seals torn off of a scroll, then seven trumpets, then seven bowls. Now, in the seals, at the beginning, we're looking at martyrs mounting. Now, how can you say there's no, and again, the pre-tribulation guys will say, well, these are the tribulation saints. Guys, this is not tribulation saints as if they're different from normal saints. Saints are saints. The tribulation saints is us. This is us. And if we're alive in the generation of the Lord's return, we will be under the altar crying out for vengeance upon those who are shedding the blood of the saints, which is one of the core themes of the book of Revelation. If you go through the highlighter and highlight all the passages that talk about the shedding of the blood of the saints in the generation of the Lord's return, there's a lot of passages, guys. And this is why it's so important that we reject a pre-tribulation eschatology because we're not prepared to shed our blood if we believe it's not our blood that's going to be shed, but someone else and that we're exempt and we get to conveniently escape. <laughs> So we could say this, in chapter 6, you can see the church on the earth loosing the seals, suffering alongside of fellow humanity that's enduring the first horses that are loosed onto the earth, which bring about cataclysmic judgment. In one judgment event, a fourth of the earth's population is killed in war, famine, pestilence, economic collapse, and then mass martyrdom. Guys, you can't say the world will suffer the first seals alone and we're not here for it when the one of the last seals to be torn is our bleeding. It's the church bleeding. It's the church being slain in mass multitudes during the tribulation, which also makes sense then why one of the main emphases in the book of Daniel or in Jesus' teaching on the end of the age or in Paul's teaching on the end of the age or in John and Peter's teaching on the end of the age is their emphasis on the need to prepare for the losing of our lives. Daniel 7 talks about the saints being crushed down by the final beast empire. Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that before he comes, one of the primary signs of the times, one of the primary birth pains will be us being delivered over to tribulation and being put to death. He says that the saints being killed in tribulation is one of the signs, the trending signs of the times that will indicate that things have ramped up from business as usual to the hard labor of great tribulation. The shedding of the blood of the saints is one of the premier signs of the times. And guys, if we don't believe that we're here on the earth, these passages don't make any sense. And again, you could say, well, that refers to the tribulation church, but we're out of here. That refers to all the people who got saved once our clothes fell on the ground and we conveniently floated away. Guys, when has God ever done anything like that in the past? He doesn't exempt his people from suffering. He saves them from wrath, but he refines them through suffering and tribulation. What, what did the apostle say in Acts 14 with the new believers? It says that he, they preached the gospel and made many disciples and then encouraged them in the faith, telling them that it is by tribulation that we inherit the kingdom. Through tribulation, 
by tribulation, in tribulation, not to be exempt from it and escape from it. Tribulation is designed for the preparation of the church who will be made splendid in the day of his return. Chapter 7 is a powerful one. We see the church growing and multiplying among every tribe, tongue, and nation. Here's a very powerful and persuasive verse. The John is looking at a mixed multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's hearing languages, different skin colors, all of this eclectic ocean of people. And the angel comes and says, hey, who are these guys? And he goes, well, I don't know. Where did they come from? And the angel says this. These are those who have come up out of the great tribulation or in the original, in the original language, who have come up out of the tribulation, the great one. Remember, in, in Revelation chapter 1, John writes and he says, to, to my brothers in tribulation, because he was in tribulation then. And now he's, he's seeing the angel saying, not, this, is not, this is not your garden variety tribulation. This is the tribulation, the great one that stands alone. The one Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. The one Jeremiah talked about in Jeremiah 30. The one that Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 12. This is the great tribulation. And look what's happening. Saints are coming up out of it in death. Those are martyrs, guys. Now, at the missions conferences, you know, if you've ever been to a missions conference, that's always the core, you know, yay, you know, every tribe, tongue, and nation. Guys, the context of that is coming up out of the tribulation, which means those who are being slain. This is the counterpart of chapter 6, meaning those who are being slain under the altar are given white robes. Who are the people in the mixed multitude? People wearing white robes singing. Guys, the saints, the only saints who are going to be in heaven, not on earth during the tribulation, are those who are killed during the tribulation and who end up being in heaven for a very short time before coming back to earth with Jesus. That's the framework of this thing. We're not going to be exempt from this thing. The only way you can escape the tribulation is if you die in the tribulation or before it, but you will not be taken out of it. Think of it another way. If Revelation 7 is not referring to the church, meaning us, the church before the tribulation, but it refers to only the church in the tribulation, beloved, you and I are not invited to that party. It's just the tribulation saints. Now ask yourself this question. Do you really think that one of the most famous and magnificent passages in the Bible about the triumph of the gospel among every nation, tribe, and tongue. Do you really think that we're going to get to that moment in history and think that we're going to be a part of it and the Lord go, oh, wait, wait, hold on. No, this party here, Revelation 7, that's exclusively for tribulation saints, only people who were not raptured at the, at the, the sounding of the, the pre-trib rapture horn. It doesn't make any sense, guys. You have to separate so many different comings of Jesus, different raptures, different groups, different parties, different wedding feasts. It doesn't make any sense. There's one coming of Jesus, one gathering of the saints, one wedding feast, one bride. This is also why it's important because if you believe there's distinction between Jew and Gentile to where we get different, different weddings and different wedding feasts and different gatherings and different raptures, guys, you end up having multiple comings, multiple gatherings, multiple marriage suppers, and you just get lost in all the activities that are taking place at the end. Jesus is not coming. He's not a polygamist. He's not coming back for multiple brides. Jew and Gentile, one new man. He's going to gather us together, the elect, on the day of his return. Let's move on to chapters 8 and 9. These are the the sounding of the trumpets. We mentioned it before, but when you look at the first five verses in here, look at this. Another angel was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. The judgment events in Revelation 8 and 9 are triggered by the prayers of the saints on the earth from where the incense rises. If the church is not on the earth during the tribulation, then who's offering the incense that's loosing the tribulation judgments? We can move on to Revelation chapter 10. All of these passages just demand long attention, but we're just skimming through them at a surface level. Chapter 10, we see the church thundering prophetic messages that have been sealed up for the time of the end. 
we hear seven thunders and the and John is is he he's told these thunders will thunder. There's coming a time for these messages to be proclaimed. Who do you think is going to be proclaiming those? It's not going to be unbelievers who get saved in the tribulation apart from the faithful witness of the crucified church in the tribulation. The reason there's going to be such a great harvest is not because there was a rapture and everyone goes, oh, wow, the rapture. Let's all follow Jesus now without no leadership on the earth to direct like Moses was directing during the plagues. I mean, this is the thing, guys. The Exodus story, it wasn't as if God just took the Israelites out. He covered them in the blood so that the wrath passed over them. The same thing is going to be happening during the tribulation. Moses and Aaron were loosing the plague judgments. They were loosing the wrath on the Antichrist empire of the day. So too will the church at the end be loosing the judgments on the Antichrist's empire. We're not going to be exempt from it, cheering it on from the balcony of heaven. No, we're going to be loosing the judgments, covered in the blood, as the wrath of God passes over us and falls upon the wicked regime and the nations of the earth that are reviling against the purposes of God and making war with the Lamb. The church will be in a position of intercession, prayer, and prophetic thundering, loosing the judgments of God, not being the victims of them. That's a very critical paradigm shift that the church needs to go through and be prepared for. And there's a lot of passages that build up the theology of this, this end time imprecatory prayer movement that's going to loose judgments on the Antichrist's empire while he's shedding the blood of the saints. It's a very key theme that we need to We need to get into the bloodstream of the global body, especially for those who are anticipating a convenient escape and exemption from it. Because think about it. How are you going to be engaged in strategic intercession and standing in the difficulty of what God's called the end time church to if you're busy freaking out in anxiety, fear, confusion, offense, and disillusionment because what you believe from those fiction novels that your grandma gave you ended up turning out to be nothing more than quasi-Christian fiction. The amount of disillusionment and offense that's going to come when the rapture doesn't happen before the tribulation is going to be astounding. Which is why the faster we walk away from this and embrace a ecclesiology, an end time ecclesiology that revolves around endurance, patience, preparation, and engagement, we're going to be in a much better place. Chapter 11, we see the saints witnessing in Jerusalem. We see them closing up heaven. We see them calling down fire. Now, this is a very interesting argument because if these are tribulation saints too, we move from being an unbeliever at the day before the tribulation starts to the day the tribulation starts being a prophet in Jerusalem calling down fire, sealing up heaven, and being some of the key players in Jerusalem throughout the duration of the Great Tribulation. Doesn't make any sense. No. The witnesses in Jerusalem who are going to be laboring in Jerusalem while the siege of Jerusalem is taking place are going to be born again believers who've been covered in the blood of the lamb, who've been prepared for years, yea, probably decades for this moment. This is not just some guy that stumbles into it in the tribulation that becomes one of the key witnesses. No, there's going to be two witnesses for sure, but there's going to be a multitude of witnesses operating in the same prophetic realities in that day. And that's not going to happen overnight just because the tribulation started. No, the tribulation starts and the witnessing goes into high gear. Chapter 11 is very powerful and very important because it localizes it into a Jerusalem-centric conflict and shows the function, the prophetic ministry, the apostolic ministry, the shepherding ministry of not just the two witnesses, but also the, wit- the the broader witnesses of the body of Christ in that day who are also going to be pivotal in the next chapter, which is chapter 12. Chapter 12, we see the saints overcoming Satan by what? The blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony that we love not our lives unto death. If the church isn't in the book of Revelation, why are we dying again? Every time you turn the page, you see the saints bleeding again. It's hard to bleed if you're not there, guys. It's hard to kill someone who's not there. Yet we see in Revelation 11, the witness of the church in proclamation. And in Revelation 12, we see the witness of the church in martyrdom. 
overcoming. Now, what's interesting is in chapter 13, it says that it was granted to the beast to overcome the saints. Yet in chapter 12, it says that we overcome the dragon by letting him kill us. So the church that overcomes in the last days is a martyr church. It's a church that gives its life away and follows in the footsteps of Jesus, which is why I believe that the preacher of rapture teaching is actually fundamentally an anti-cross gospel. Because the end time scenario is one of martyrdom following in the way of the cross. So therefore then, in light of the fact that the preacher of rapture exempts you from the final crucifixion scenario for the end time church, it is an anti-cross, an anti-cross eschatology. And I think Jesus would deal with us the same way that he dealt with Jesus with Peter in Matthew 16. When Peter said, Jesus, you don't need to bear the cross. Don't do that. What did Jesus say? You're thinking the thoughts of men, not of God. Get behind me, Satan. I believe that is the exhortation from heaven today concerning the preacher of rapture. These are the thoughts of men, not the thoughts of God. Get behind me, Satan. It's a demonically influenced teaching because it gives people the false hope that they will not have to endure tribulation. That is a very dangerous teaching with far-reaching consequences. Chapter 12, we not only see the church overcoming Satan and seeing the church bleeding, giving herself away in martyrdom, we also see the church suffering with Israel in the wilderness and being persecuted by the devil because of our connection to Israel. So there's an Israel church relationship in Revelation 12 that binds us together and we experience not the wrath of God, but the wrath of Satan. So we are not appointed to the wrath of God. We are appointed to the wrath of Satan in that God has a purpose for our crucifixion in the same way that he had a purpose for Jesus' crucifixion. Guys, we follow a crucified king. It doesn't look good when we throw off that model and that example to which he has called us to walk as well. There is a suffering pilgrim way that's coming for the church at the end of the age that's associated, connected to Israel's final trouble. This is another reason why it's essential that we are prepared and bracing for and equipped for the days ahead because it's going to have consequences for the Jewish people. Chapter 13, we already mentioned it. We see the church being cut down by the Antichrist, by the beast in the final empire, shedding the blood of the saints in mass in chapter 13. Chapter 14, we see the church prophesying, singing, clothed in prophetic power and authority. And we see a great harvest, two harvests actually, a harvest of the wicked and a harvest of the righteous. There's going to be a great harvest harvest during those days. And it's not because the church was taken away and the great harvest came. It's because the church stepped into her greatest hour during the tribulation. It's because of the church in the tribulation that the great harvest will be happening, not because of her escape from it. That's a very key point. Revelation 15 and 16, we see the church in the same way that the church's intercession was releasing the trumpets and the seals, now releasing the bold judgments as well in chapter 15 and chapter 16. Revelation 17 and 18, we see the saints all over it. The passages are, I'll just read a couple of them to you right now. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, Revelation 16. So we have saints and prophets bleeding in the days of the rise of the harlot Babylon. Revelation 17, I saw the woman, the harlot Babylon, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Guys, if the church isn't there, why do we see so much martyrdom and blood of the saints? Why do we see the saints on every page, either engaged in intercession, engaged in prophetic ministry, engaged in witness, engaged in martyrdom, engaged in solidarity with the Jewish people, engaged in opposing the enemy, engaged in being cut down by the Antichrist? Why, if the church isn't in the book of Revelation, are we reading about the church on every page of the book of Revelation? Revelation 18. Verse 24, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints. Again, I thought there weren't saints here. Revelation 19, 2, he has avenged on her, the harlot Babylon, the blood of his servants shed by her. In Revelation 18, verse 20, rejoice, you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. I mean, this is powerful. Revelation 20, 
I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast, the Antichrist. Guys, if the church isn't on the earth in the tribulation, why are they being beheaded for not worshiping the man who's at the center of the great tribulation, executing the great wrath upon the earth during that time? Again, you can take the cheap, convenient argument that these are the tribulation saints and not the saints, but guys, step back for a minute. If you didn't know any systematic teaching, if you didn't know any outside teaching, this is the first time that you read the book of Revelation, you would come away with an overwhelming emphasis and conviction and belief that the saints are an integral part of the storyline of the book of Revelation, and that their suffering and that their blood is one of the main themes that is developed and held at the center of this great story and narrative. When we deny that, it you can't take you can't take the saints out of the book of Revelation. It's all over it. The only thing that you can do is redefine what saint means. It means It doesn't mean the church. It doesn't mean us. It doesn't mean you. It doesn't mean the generation that's alive then. It means unbelievers who got saved after the rapture. Guys, if you can show me a verse where it says that, because here's the thing. How many verses... When we go through all these and you stack them and talk about saints, 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 believers, brothers and sisters, those who believe in the testimony of Jesus, those who are martyred for their testimony, their witness to Jesus. If you go through and you stack all of them up, you're basically saying, okay, all these verses are going to be redefined by one argument without a verse? Show me where these passages say that this is not the church of today, but it is the tribulation church of tomorrow. And that there is a divide between them and it's not the same church. That there's two different ones. There's the church of the now, then there's the church then. Where? Why? How? For what reason? On what basis? On what scripture? If you want to be a Berean who Paul exalted as the great example of faithfulness to biblical integrity, search it out and ask hard questions. Here's a hard question for the pre-tribulation camp. Why is there so much blood of believers spilled over on every single page in the book of Revelation if the saints aren't there? It doesn't make any sense. Moreover, and we'll end with this, when we read in Revelation 19, 20, 21, 22, we read about, quote, a bride who is prepared and made herself ready in context to Jesus coming on a white horse. This is very important. The day, the description of the final scenario at the end of the age when Jesus comes back for his bride and she's made ready, that's what John records and sees. He sees the bride being made ready, not in chapter 4 before the judgment events begin. John sees the church in Revelation 19 being prepared and made ready to meet the Lord. And then we get to Revelation 22, and the the climax of the book of Revelation is the Maranatha cry, which is, come, Lord Jesus. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Even so, in light of all the judgment events, in light of everything that will befall us as we pray for this, as we cry for your return, knowing what it will mean when you do return, even so, in light of everything that we've read, in light of everything that we've heard, in light of everything that we know that's going to precede the day that you come on that white horse covered in blood and flaming fire, in light of all that, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We, ye- we yearn, we long, we ache for your appearing. Guys, if the church is taken away, taken out in Revelation 4, who is being prepared in Revelation 19 and who is crying, come Lord Jesus in Revelation 22? From the beginning to the end, the book of Revelation tells the story of a church in splendor at the end of all things engaged in God's purposes on the earth in the generation of his appearing, in the generation that will culminate in the singular day of the Lord when Jesus comes once, when Jesus comes to gather his people to himself, bring this present evil age to a close and inaugurate the next. Guys, this is a much more coherent and simple story. And the beautiful thing is, Just on an emotional level, this is a much better story 
I know it may from a from a standpoint of self preservation and dare I say laziness. It's it, it is much more enjoyable to say you know what I'd rather skip out in the tribulation, hang out, eat popcorn, put my feet up in heaven. I'd rather that. No, I don't think that's the kind of people the Lord's raising up in these days. I think he's raising up a church that's going to say what the church is saying in Revelation 22, even so, even so, come Lord, we trust you. We trust your judgment. We trust your hand. We trust your heart. We trust your mind. We trust everything about you. You are trustworthy. In light of all that, God, we're ready. We want to be made ready. We're not ready, but we want to be ready. Make us ready, Lord. Make us ready for your return. Make us ready for your return and make us ready for the days of trouble that will precede that day. Thank you guys for listening. I hope this was helpful. Pass it to someone who is awaiting exemption and escape. And let's pray that the Lord would bind us all together in a spirit of unity and prepare us for the days of trouble ahead. Bless you and Maranatha.